Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 2, Text 6. I'll read the translation. The verse is in prose. It's not, well, it's not really a verse. The text is in prose. And the translation is as follows. This is a description of the Apsara Purvachiti, who was sent to attract the mind of Agnidra. Purvachiti is a an Apsara of the heavenly worlds. This is a description of her coming before Agnidra with the specific intention of agitating his mind by her feminine attraction. In other words, it's a talk about, it's a discussion of sexual attraction. I'll read the verse. Like a honeybee, the Apsara smelled the beautiful and attractive flowers. She could attract the minds and vision of both humans and demigods by her playful movements, her shyness and humility, her glances, the very pleasing sounds that poured from her mouth as she spoke and the motion of her limbs. By all these qualities she opened for Cupid, who bears an arrow of flowers, a path of oral reception into the minds of men. When she spoke, nectar seemed to flow from her mouth. As she breathed, the bees, mad for the taste of her breath, tried to hover about her beautiful lotus-like eyes. Disturbed by the bees, she tried to move hastily, but as she raised to, as she raised her feet to walk quickly, her hair, the belt on her hips, and her breasts, which were like water jugs, also moved in a way that made her extremely beautiful and attractive. Indeed, she seemed to be making a path for the entrance of Cupid, who is most powerful. Therefore the prince, completely subdued by seeing her, spoke to her as follows. Srila Prabhupada's purport to this. <clears throat> How a beautiful woman's movements and gestures, her hair and the structure of her breasts, hips and other bodily features attract the minds not only of men but of demigods also is very finely described in this statement. The words Divija and Manuja specifically emphasize that the attraction of feminine gestures is very powerful everywhere within this material world, both on this planet and in the higher planetary systems. It is said that the standard of living in the higher planetary systems is thousands and thousands of times higher than the standard of living on this planet, on this planet. Therefore, the beautiful bodily features of the women there are also thousands and thousands of times more attractive than the features of women on earth. The Creator has constructed women in such a way that their beautiful voices and movements and the beautiful features of their hips, their breasts and the other parts of their bodies attract the members of the opposite sex, both on earth and on other planets, and awaken their lusty desires. When one is controlled by Cupid or the beauty of women, he becomes stunned like matter such as stone. Captivated by the material movements of women, he wants to remain in this material world. Thus one's promotion to the spiritual world is checked simply by seeing the beautiful bodily structure and movements of women. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has therefore warned all devotees to beware of the attraction of beautiful women and materialistic civilization. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu even refused to see Prataparudra Maharaj because he, Maharaj, was a very opulent person in this material world. Lord Chaitanya said in this connection, Niskinchanasya Bhagavad Bhajanon Mukhasya, those who are engaged 
in devotional service, in the devotional service of the Lord, because they are very serious about going back home, back to Godhead, should be very careful to avoid seeing the beautiful gestures of women and should also avoid seeing persons who are very rich. Nishkinchanasya Bhagavad Bhajanon Mukasya Parang Parangjiga Mesha Bhavasagarasya Sandarshanam Vishayinam Atayoshitam Cha Ha Hanta Hanta Vishabhakshana Topya Sadhu Alas for a person who is seriously desiring to cross the material ocean and engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord without material motives, seeing a materialist engaged in sense gratification or seeing a woman who is similarly interested is more abominable than drinking poison willingly. One who is serious about going back home, back to Godhead, should not contemplate the attractive features of women and the opulence of rich men. Such contemplation will check one's advancement in spiritual life. Once a devotee is fixed in Krishna consciousness, however, these attractions will not agitate his mind. Uh, this is a very good part for those young ladies who are very interested in entering beauty contests. The statement that the bodily features of the women in the heavenly planets is thousands and th thousands and thousands of times more attractive than the features of the women on earth. You're wasting your time. The, the most beautiful woman in this world is just, her beauty is insignificant to that of th those on the heavenly planets. And all those women who comb their hair and put on lipstick and eye shadow and eye brow this and powder and so many different things to make themselves look attractive. You want to be thousands and thousands of times more beautiful? Be pious, which for a woman means to be a uh, faithful follower of her husband, and by that piety you can get elevated to the heavenly planets. Then you can be much more beautiful. And for a very long time, however long you can be beautiful on this earth, on this, this Kali Yuga, it doesn't last. It all gets worn out. Now, the reason I chose to spoke on this purport, I wanted to, to, to discuss... Uh, few points. Um, some years ago, one of my godbrothers, <clears throat> I met him in Vrindavan, and it was after quite a few years, I hadn't seen him for quite a few years, and I heard that in the meantime, he'd been away, and he'd joined the Osho movement, which is not expected of devotees who have transcendental knowledge <clears throat> to go to such a low-class organization where they purport to advance in spiritual life by engaging in unlimited sex. So I asked him about this. I said, hey, what are you doing there? What do you, what do you go there for? And he said, he told me that by reading the Bhagavatam, certain descriptions within the Bhagavatam had awakened desires in him which he wanted to indulge. And actually, it's a fact. There's a lot of description of illicit sex in the Bhagavatam, in the Ramayana, the whole story, or the, the main thrust of the story. It is around Ravana's desire for illicit sex. The Mahabharata, especially the Adi Parva, but uh, there's so many descriptions of how Karna was born. It wasn't really Kunti's desire for illicit sex. She was just curious to see the sun god. And the sun god saw her 
And for him, it wasn't illicit sex. But from Kunti's point of view, it would appear like that. Similarly, the, uh, the, 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 the a child was born to her out of wedlock. And then we have the story very similar to the Moses story, how she put the child into a basket in water and went on to become a very prominent personality known in history up to the present time, both Moses and Karna. Uh, the birth of Vyasadev was irregular. There are so many in, in the in the Bhagavatam, the the birth of Bharadvaj and the 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 lusty affairs of Indra, uh, how Ahalya she became cursed by her husband Gautam due to her illicit relationship. Then uh, Renuka, the mother of Parashuram. There's so many, so many, so many stories. And here we have quite a, quite a, quite an explicit description of how the Apsara Purvachiti deliberately agitated the mind of uh, Agnidra. Oh, another very famous one is the Vishwamitra and Menaka, which gave rise to uh, Shakuntala and uh, so many, to Shanta, so many, so many. Now we have to remember that these Shastras, they're not meant for awakening our lusty desires, they're meant for educating us to overcome the lusty desires that bind us in the material world. Here within the Bhagavatam, we find the description of how Krishna and the, the members of the Yadu dynasty and others, they engaged in water sports, in the water, playing, and the, the queens of Krishna were there, and the, the, the queens in the water, their saris clung to their bodies, in such a way that their bodily features were highlighted and how persons who had not controlled their senses became sexually agitated by seeing this. Although those whose minds were pure, their minds were not agitated. There is, within the Vedic literature or the, the the broader body of Vedic literature there there is descriptions of how to agitate one's senses with the idea or, or there there are descriptions of how uh, women and men come together that there, there is lust but that within a controlled atmosphere Dhamavi Rudho Bhuteshu Kamosmi Bharatar Shabha. The lust which is channeled within religious dharmic channels, that is a representation of Krishna. So that is allowed. Illicit sex, one great lesson we get from these stories is how illicit sex is very troublesome, even licit sex is troublesome, but illicit sex is very, very troublesome. Now, one thing that Srila Prabhupada often emphasized and has been criticized for this is that how he emphasized so much on the dangers of sexual attraction. He's been criticized for that saying that, well, previous Acharyas, they didn't speak about this so much. Srila Prabhupada spoke about it so much because of our need to hear that. 
especially his Western disciples. But nowadays in India also, there are pawns here on the internet. Even before the age of, in, of the internet, the movies, very lusty. Specifically for inciting lusty desires. Mm. Srila Prabhupada is very aware that these lusty desires, they, they can completely destroy one's spiritual tendencies or severely cover them over. And that the whole civilization at the present time, what's called civilization, is running on these lusty desires. It's this consumer civilization, get more, buy more. It's all for sense gratification and having prestigious items uh, to show yourself as being bigger and better. And the whole idea is to show yourself off to the opposite sex, directly or indirectly. Mm. The over, overly uh, zapped up civilization, ad ov overly adrenaline. <laughs> We see now it's uh, on, on this social media, people like to show photos of themselves with, as if they're having some super adrenaline experience and that's equated with happiness. And then they go and commit suicide. <laughs> or you, you have to show yourself being super happy and big smile. It's not enough to just look content. But you, have, you have to be like super, super zapped up. Yeah, the lizard likes my talks. <laughs> but this, uh, they don't know what happiness is. They think that happiness means to be super zapped up. And the consumer civilization, they, they promise you buy this, buy that, get this, do that, and get zapped up. And then you get, and, then, you, then you'll be happy. But that's not happiness. That's just some experience, which is a very poor substitute for happiness. Sex attraction. That's the, that's the biggest thing, sex attraction. Generally, that's seen as the, the highest pleasure. Well, the Bhagavatam teaches us that, that the whole... The, the Bhagavatam teaches that the whole of what is called civilization, materialistic civilization, is based on sex attraction. You may say, well, where is that in the Bhagavatam? I'll tell you. Pungsastriya mituni bhavam etam tayoraho hridya grantimahu ato griha kshetra sutabda vitaya janasya moho yamahamma meti. We are bound in this material world by the illusion of thinking in terms of I, me, and mine. That illusion becomes very strong when it is specifically directed or, or captured by that attraction between male and female. It becomes a very strong bond on the heart and then develops when one is in a relationship, as they call it nowadays. Previously, people used to get married. Now they talk about being in a relationship. I mean, it's something going on. It's not formal. It's not so... Can be serious or not serious, as much as you take it. User-defined. So, in a relationship, what does that mean? Then, there's you and me... We need a place to live in, the Togriha. Then we need a little space around a house, or we have a, or we identify with the country we live in. We have children, and then there's the broader family, relatives, friend, friends, money. That is the basics of civilization. Money, friends, land, people who are bound together by relationship. And the relationships 
The basic relationship is that from sexual attraction, and from that, everything else comes. So Srila Prabhupada, he often stressed this point that material civilization, especially the present civilization, it's based on sex attraction. Who would who would say that? Say no, civilization. What's the basis? The basis is uh, you know, democracy, morality, law and order, high principles. That's the difference between civilization and savage life. No, material civilization is based on sexual attraction. One of those shocking things that Srila Prabhupada said, often said, which is true if you just think about it a little bit. And every civilization thinks, wait a minute, I didn't say it yet. The lizard's getting too enthusiastic, thinks he's reading my mind. The, uh, every civilization thinks ours is the pinnacle, the best ever. How many civilizations, they, they, we don't even know the name, historians may know. Now we have the Pax Americana, previous series. If, if you don't agree with us what we do, we'll, you don't want democracy, we'll bomb you. And then you can have democracy by force. Uh, before that it was Pax Britannica. Yeah, Britain rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Uh, yeah, we, we keep a peaceful situation. If you if you don't agree with what we do, we'll bomb you, and then you won't be able to protest about us. Now, everyone thinks it's the, ours is the best civilization. Is it is Romans? The Romans are the best. And Babylonians, Babylonians are the best. Egyptian civilization, Sumerian, and how many have there been? How many will? There be? And what what happens? Civilization. It's it's like. The, the human lifespan, it's, it, there's a baby, it grows, it lasts for some time, looks strong and healthy, it gradually deteriorates, and then it's dead and finished. So also that's the fate of all civilizations. But in the meantime, everyone thinks we're the best. Building, big buildings, and then what's left? You can see in Greece and Rome, the remnants of an ancient civilization. What's left there? The, the stadiums are in Rome, right? That's a sign of a great civilization. You build a big stadium and people come and they cheer the sportsmen. And the sportsmen are all dead and so are the spectators. <clears throat> Since I've been alive in this body and aware and aware of more than gaga goo goo and how to get food. I've been hearing about this modern civilizations on the verge of collapse. I was just listening the other day to us to uh, some scientists. Nowadays they'd be called environmentalists. I don't think they were called that at the time. They were talking with Srila Prabhupada, this is in the 1970s, that if we don't make drastic changes now, the whole Earth's planet and the whole civilization will be finished. Well, they didn't make the drastic changes, and still the civilization is going on. But there have been so many prophecies and prospects of civilizational collapse, and with the coronavirus, it was considered with the lockdowns, and it's going to collapse the economy, and it's always on the verge of collapse. It'll happen someday or other. Just because it didn't happen yet doesn't mean that it won't happen. Civilizations do collapse. And then they rebuild. It's not the end of civilization. It's just that the, the power shifts from one locus to another. That's all. Civilization goes on. This is the story of civilization. One after another, one after another. Uh, <clears throat> and what, what are they doing? They're looking for pleasure. And the pleasure is ultimately sexual pleasure, the same as the animals get. They want pleasure, they want power, 
We have in the Bhagavatam also the description of the gods and the demons that they, when they want to get the nectar of immortality. They fight each other over that. Sometimes they cooperate and then they fight. And what, what is it? They want to get the, the nectar of immortality, so-called immortality. It's not really immortality. It gives them a very long life. So they're fighting. Actually, they, neither, neither the demigods care that much for each other, nor do the demons care that much for each other. But the de demigods cooperate together. They come together as a civilization to fulfill their purpose so that they can individually get the nectar. And then when they got it, then who's going to take it? What order are we going to be in? Because they're all anxious to get it. So everyone's out for themselves, but what they call civilization, they all cooperate because they find it's better fulfilling, for fulfilling their individual selfish desires. Of course, both the demons and the demigods missed the real nectar, they had so much opportunity. The, 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 <clears throat> the Supreme Lord himself came to assist the demigods in churning by pulling the rope of Vasuki, the snake. Then the Ajit avatar came <clears throat> to act as a pivot for Mandara Mountain. <clears throat> and... Uh, Mohini Murti, the female form of the Lord, came. He was there, she was there, but they, they missed it. None of them thought, oh, the real happiness is in surrendering to Krishna. They never, they never got that. So anyone who wants material happiness, even piously, like the demigods, they're foolish. <laughs> they have this similar mentality to the demons. We find the descriptions in the Mahabharata of illicit sex, it's mostly all rishis and demigods who are doing it. Because the desire for enjoyment is the basic principle of material existence. That's why we see there's this, there's this whole thing going on in, in our Krishna conscious movement of <clears throat> yes, you should have a good career and chant Hare Krishna, and you should do well in your studies and chant Hare Krishna, get lots of money and chant Hare Krishna. You should have the two side by side, but why? <laughs> you chant Hare Krishna, and then you can do some studies and you do something to so-called earn a living, or you can come and join our farms and chant Hare Krishna with us. Uh, but this whole emphasis, you have... You have to make yourself a big success and show yourself to be great. It's just hollow. It's pious. It's not pure devotional service. It's not what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give and came to teach. Srila mm. Prabhupada came to teach us how to make an actual civilization which is based on, not on pravriti, Ah. Pravriti is sarva bhutanam nivritis tu maha palam. By pravriti, which means the path of sense enjoyment, even pious sense enjoyment. Everyone's interested in that. The Krishna conscious movement is meant for more, meant for nivriti, turn, where we can get the highest result, turn away from this whole idea of enjoying this material world different type of civilization. Materialistic people, pious or impious, they cannot imagine a different kind of civilization in which we <coughs> work to live and work to glorify Krishna rather than just living to work. And then if, if you're lucky, you glorify Krishna and the little bit of time you get left over from your working like an ass. So, one of the mandates that Srila Prabhupada left for us is to show a different kind of civilization. Even Srila Prabhupada's disciples, they didn't believe him when he told them, you can live simply, go to the land, 
You don't need all these modern trappings. Live as simply as possible and chant Hare Krishna. And they don't believe that. Even some of them went to the land, but still they needed you know, there so many things and gadgets and TVs and guitars and so many things. But they don't need it. And then they have to go. So the, the, the farms that Srila Prabhupada had acquired became rural residential colonies for uh, commuting city workers, which was not Srila Prabhupada's idea. Go to the land, live simply. That requires vairagya vidya. Srila Prabhupada said, unless they're Krishna conscious, they cannot live simply. Unless one has the, the knowledge and actually believe it, that we that human life is meant for God realization. Put that thing first and then we consider how to live our life on the basis of that. Not that, well, my real purpose of life is to live in this world and I'll tag onto that Krishna consciousness. You know, Srila Prabhupada wanted to show a completely different approach to civilization. Not just simple living, but living on the farms, if we live as actually simple living, yes, but showing by that simple living and chanting Hare Krishna is preaching that everything Srila Prabhupada taught us is true, that we don't need to live in these hellish, demoniac cities. We don't need to live in them. We can live by the grace of Krishna the way he gave us to live. Of course, in, when Krishna was present personally, there were cities also, but not these whoosh, whoosh, motor car, polluted and stressed, gross sense gratification cities. Not cities like that. But we have to show at the farms that you can live without a sex-based sense gratification civilization. Our civilization is really based on a higher principle. And sex is there. It's not edited out. Farm community means it's going to be mostly families and we'll be, we'll be very happy if the children, that will be the real success of our farm community if the devotees are Krishna conscious and their children remain on the farms as devotees and they're happy to do so. And that means that they'll also marry, which means they'll have sex and they'll have children. So it's not that sex is edited out, but it's a facet of life. But it's not something to be so much emphasized as if it's such a, a, a great thing against this, this over, 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 stre too much adrenaline. And, uh, yes, we can, we can have real high powered happiness. High energy happiness, kirtan, strong kirtan, that we can have. But that's something completely different from the, the happiness of kirtan, of kirtan which is performed for Krishna's pleasure, not for our own musical sense gratification or to show I'm a great kirtania. But real kirtan, that, that is, uh, is a different category altogether. People don't know. Lokasya janata vidvangs chakra sattvata sanghita. People don't know. So Vyasadeva gave these books, especially the Srimad Bhagavatam. <clears throat> so our, our Grihasya devotees are living on the farms and they're going on with their lives. But it's, and sex is there, but it's, it's, not, it's not such a big thing. Can you believe it? It doesn't have to be such a big thing. Krishna is the big thing. Devotional service is the big thing. That's what we're living for. Not working like some miserable rat in a rat race, 
so that we can have sex with some other rat. And for that, we have to have so much, so much, so much endeavor to get all the things together. Yeah, if you marry a rat, don't be, don't be surprised if, if the rat bites you. We should have a higher consciousness, Krishna consciousness. Uh, this is Krishna consciousness. I talked a lot about, I've used the word sex a lot in this talk, but that's just to point out that it's overly hyped. Real life is with Krishna. We're meant for studying the Bhagavatam. There are descriptions in there which if someone is cultivating lusty desires, they may disturb his mind in a lusty way, but it's not meant for that. It's meant to point out this is what we should not be doing. This is the trap of thinking that this is in enjoyable. Therefore, in Vedic culture, because as Srila Prabhupada describes in this purport, the, the speaking, the movements, the smell, the whole atmosphere that women, especially young women, generate, consciously or unconsciously, they tend to generate such a uh, such an atmosphere that men tend to be agitated by that. And therefore, Vedic culture, the central principle is controlling that attraction. And one a major way to do it is by separation of the sexes, uh, specific roles that they play, uh, to control this very dangerous desire because even great demigods can be agitated by that. What to speak of us small living beings? We have to be very careful. Uh, <clears throat> we have to be very careful because if we become agitated for sense enjoyment, then our consciousness of Krishna becomes covered or it becomes very difficult to keep properly absorbed in Krishna consciousness. I remember many years ago, one of my god brothers, he just newly married, good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine, and still married to the same wife. <laughs> we become surprised when we hear that. Uh, he told me frankly, he, he thought you know, I was not... I hadn't taken sannyasa. So, yeah, you should get married also. I said, no. He said, but he said, see, I'm, I, when I'm chanting, even, I can't stop thinking of my wife. Even when I'm chanting my japa, he was saying, he was very excited by being newly married. It, 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 the excitement doesn't last very long. The duty kicks in. Uh, but he frankly told me, he's very excited by that. And I, I, I suppose, he needed to get married for that, and he's done well in his household life. He raised his children as devotees. And uh, that, that, may be that may be required if we... But we should know that this... Yeah, he kept... He, he was thinking of his wife while he's chanting his japa. <laughs> but uh, he went on chanting japa. He didn't stop chanting 16 rounds a day. He went on and gradually he came out of that very big illusion which usually sweeps over couples when they're newly married. And they settle down and get into, the, if they're devotees, then they can get on with their life in Krishna consciousness. There may be some heightened illusion just on marrying. Not, maybe not in all cases. But we should know, we should know, and we need to discuss these things as Srila Prabhupada did very often, more than did previous acharyas, due to the present need of, we should know the present need of human society, Srila Prabhupada. What is the present need of human society? We need to cut the air pollution. 
we need to stop the depletion of the rainforests. Uh, these are all secondary needs. We need to become Krishna conscious. That is the overwhelming need. Uh, so many problems are solved, even not becoming Krishna conscious directly, but just understanding that this sexual attraction, although it seems wonderful, it is the cause of so many problems. Yet, oh, what is that verse? That uh, Vishayendriya samyogam yatadagre mitopamam pariname vishamiva tatsukam rajasam smritam. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna states that the sensation that arises from engaging the senses with the sense objects immediately feels just like nectar, but it turns into poison. That is happiness in the mode of passion. Material civilization means happiness in the mode of passion. In the purport to that verse, Srila Prabhupada gives the example that a young man meets a young woman and in the beginning there it seems all very nice, but gradually it all turns to poison. Uh, so a whole civilization based on a misunderstanding is not real civilization. We need to demonstrate something better. And in our individual lives also, we have to understand this. It's very useful for young people especially if they can, if they can hear this. Mostly young people, they can't, they, they're not going to listen to talks like this. If it's something which appeals to their immediate sensual attraction, sensual attraction, then they may be interested. It, it's the whole, they're, they're, we, we hear about what's it called, attention deficit disorder, something like that, in which they, they, can't, they can't concentrate on something because um, unless something gives them immediate, an immediate adrenaline rush, then they they just can't keep their attention on it. They need to be pumped all the time with high adrenaline in, uh, instigators, and then then they feel then they can relate to it. And then they have to have rock music and drugs and so many things. It's insane, insane in the name of civilization. It's completely insane. So let us show something better. Study Bhagavatam. Study it in the proper consciousness. Let us not be misled by the tricks of Maya, which have caused us so much suffering, life after life. Let us aspire for the lotus feet of Krishna. The first canto of Bhagavatam, lotus feet of Krishna. Let us enter, put our heads at the lotus feet of Krishna by opening the book and reading and gradually take our meditation up, 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 up to the smiling face of Krishna, the tenth canto. Hare Krishna. Mancha kalpa tarubhyascha kripa sindhu patita Patitanam pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Dante Nitaya Tunakang Padiyani Patya Kritva Chakakushatameta the Humbra Vimi He Sadava Sakala Evi Bihaya Durang Goranga Chandra Charne Hare Krishna